holiday week. Big questions about who gets a better gift. The Lot J development proposal continues to generate debate. Former Mayor John Delaney joins us, sharing the position of the Civic Council, where Delaney is chairman. We're also looking at the election results and the impact for Democrats. The leader of the local party joins us after Duval turned blue, but the state of Florida fell back. That's all on This Week in Jacksonville. And thank you for joining us this holiday weekend. I hope that you've had a great Thanksgiving, that you've found lots to be grateful for. And as a matter of fact, I am grateful that John Delaney is with us today, the former president at UNF, former two-term mayor in the city of Jacksonville, and currently the chairman of the Jacksonville Civic Council. Recently, uh, you sent a letter on behalf of Civic Council to the mayor, to all the city council members, specifically on the Lot J development proposal. What's, what's the view of the Civic Council? Well, we, we like the concept, the idea of a big economic development project, particularly in the downtown, we think is a good thing. We think, uh, you know, it's not unanimity among members, but our strong consensus is that that would also help benefit the Jaguars. But we felt there's four considerations that have to be included. Uh, the first is time to consider it, not rush it through. Uh, secondly, transparency, that the documents are out there. Third, that there's legal protections for the city. You know, lawyers' job is to provide the answers to the what if. What if this happens? What if that happens? You know, what do you do? And finally, that there's an upside to the city. There's a benefit to the city. That may be intangible. There's a lot of economic right. development things that are not measurable. Uh, but we think if those four considerations are included, that it would be a benefit to the city on balance. But those are four big things. Well, the first thing you said was time. I spoke to Mayor Curry recently and uh, asked him about that. And he said, what, what do you mean the rush? There's a process. It's going through the process. We don't feel like it's being rushed. Uh, why would the Civic Council feel like maybe it is? Well, at that stage, I think there was this idea that it was going to get voted on by the middle of November, and that's awfully quick to do a couple hundred million dollar deal. Even though the administration's worked on it for about two years, the City Council and the public really hasn't had a chance to digest it. And even now, they're still working on the documents. In other words, there's not really a final bill for the City Council to vote on, and they're working feverishly on it. And um, so to some extent, we're a little nuanced in our position. We like the concept, but you've got those four considerations. The reason time is important is that the more people that look at it and look for some things that may blow up later, it's better to have considered that now than to try to fix it after the fact. Yeah. So uh, may blow up later. So recently there was a blow up. It was called a city council meeting. Give me your thoughts on what we saw here just a week or so ago. Uh, th this meeting was specific to let's talk about the proposal and it seemed to go off the rails. Uh, the JAGS president, uh, the chief administrator, the chief of staff, other council members, they all got irritated and it doesn't look like there was much progress made. No, I hope they've got one coming up that I'm hoping is, is going to be able to be a little more productive. And, um, you know, I think the country's worn out when you really get down to it. And, and it seems so many of us think we're 100 percent right and the other side's 100 percent wrong. And in that case, I think the council president was trying to understand one of the amendments that was on the floor and if a subsequent amendment, what the difference was between those two. And so there was a blow up by a former council president. Right. And um, um, I imagine he, uh, he may, may not regret it, but uh, it sure didn't look good on TV, that's for sure. That isn't the way democracy ought to work, especially among people that are colleagues and are yep. sitting as far apart as you and I are. They're pretty close. Uh, one of the things that has come up about this is, hey, where's the downtown investment authority in all of this? Uh, the DIA approved up to $12.5 million in property tax rebates, but do you favor that agency's increased involvement? Should they be more involved in this? We did. That was one of those considerations that we had. We had a section that normally a downtown project, uh, project goes through the professional uh, uh, examination by the DIA, the Downtown Investment Authority. That's what the staff does, you know, day in and day out is look at those deals. They waive those provisions, and I think it's now heading back for them to check it. You know, the city council doesn't get to renegotiate the whole deal. That's not the way these things work. They can say we'd like these two, three, four changes, but you don't get to throw it out the window and start all over. And, you know, it shouldn't be rushed, but you shouldn't dilly-dally either. As big as it is, you've got to kind of time the markets. You've got to make sure that we don't, we don't miss the market opportunities as a community. And so uh, it sounds like I just had a few conversations with some insiders yesterday. I think they're trying to get together and solve some of those questions that the auditor raised, the, the city council auditor. We had some of those same objections, and we included that in the letter as well. Yeah, the president of the Jaguars, Mark Lamping, appeared at that city council meeting. He's been up front, front and center, on the whole proposal. 
And it seemed like, uh, I said irritated earlier, it seemed like there was some frustration mounting. Uh, is that a concern that maybe the Jaguars say, okay, if you take too long, we don't want to do this? Well, you know, most business deals are done behind closed doors. People go back and forth, shake hands, they walk, walk apart. With the government involved, Different. particularly in Florida, <laughs> it's open sunshine. And so uh, the yelling and screaming that goes behind closed doors and then you shake hands at the end of the day like, you know, Wiley Coyote and, and uh, the Roadrunner, yeah. um, it is painful if you're not used to that. Um, and the Jaguars aren't used to that, obviously. And, um, but I did speak to Mark Lamp Lamping uh, just a few days ago. He's very measured. He understands. He's at peace. And, and uh, they're working hard. They want to make it work. They want the community to understand it. I think one of the things that, um, and it's logical to say, well, why not extend the lease? And he recently explained that the league has to approve an extension to a lease, and those are pretty much conditioned on work and improvements to the stadium, not a related project. So uh, I think that'll come later as we get a little closer. Um, you know, we got that team really on the cheap. You know, we barely got it as it was for the stadium that we were building at the time. Uh, much like an iPhone or, uh, you know, your television sets, there's improvements all the time. And uh, we're the landowner there, and we need to continue to improve that stadium to make the, the team viable and competitive. And uh, so I think that's going to be coming in the next few years. I view it as healthy. We own that stadium no matter what. Other events also go in that stadium. Well, so how critical is it to get clawback power? This is a phrase that I'd heard uh, thrown around here, maybe insisting that the Jaguars don't leave. Um, I don't know if they can do that because those are really unrelated kinds of things, but I think what you can do is to make sure that that project works there even if the Jaguars left. I think the way the deal is is that Shad Khan's going to own it even if the team left. Nobody's presuming the team's going to leave. I think they're going to stay. There's not a lot of other great cities to move to. And so he's going to have a vested interest in it working. Uh, you do need to remind people, San Diego's lost a team. Los Angeles has lost a couple teams. Uh, Cleveland lost a team. Baltimore's lost a team. Oakland twice. Oakland twice, <laughs> that's right. Houston's lost a team. So they do move. And that's why I think it's a partnership. And uh, when they win in particular, the town loves it. It's good for the psyche and the morale of the city, and, and, and they'll get it going in the next couple years. Yeah. I, I don't want to depress people who are watching now, or maybe we would talk about the Jaguars, but one and nine, forget about it. Let's move on from that. <laughs> uh, speaking of moving on, I'll tell you what, uh, I do want to uh, keep you here. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to talk some more, and we're going to take a short break, but I've asked Mr. Delaney to stay with us, and we're going to talk about uh, dueling problems for Duval County. One seems to have a fix on the way, solving the other remains a mystery. And that's next on This Week in Jacksonville. Plus no payments until 2021. Key of Orange Park, Southside Key. Key of Jacks on to the max. Watch Ken Jefferson, News 4 Jacks crime and safety expert, every night starting at 5. The Samsung Air Fry Oven is a time-saving, space-saving, holiday meal-making wonder. A gift for your kitchen brings joy to all. Shop the full Samsung suite of kitchen appliances now at Lowe's. Trust isn't something that's given. It's earned. And throughout our lives, we trust our doctors because they've been there for us with their dedication and courage. That's why we worked with them to design Ascension Complete St. Vincent's, a trusted Medicare Advantage plan that was made with your health in mind. It includes a $0 monthly plan premium and primary care doctor copay, dental benefits, including an allowance for dentures and other dental services, $50 savings each month with a Part B premium rebate, spiritual and emotional care with a chaplain anytime anywhere call us today at 844-688-3870 to speak with an ascension complete saint vincent's advisor and request your free enrollment guide the annual enrollment period runs from october 15th to december 7th so now is the time to switch ascension complete saint vincent's a medicare advantage plan you can trust made by the doctors you trust 844-688-3870 my father, just a few weeks ago, passed away from lung cancer. It was definitely a wake-up call. I don't want to end up passing early as my father did. I still like to be living comfortable and healthy. I want to have a chance to spend a good life. I want to be there for my boys. 
Visit TobaccoFreeFlorida.com to find free resources to help you quit your way. I've been practicing injury law for over 40 years. If there's one thing I've learned, it's this. The more we listen to you, the more we can help. Farah and Farah. So, with no payments due to next year. Kia Orange Park, Southside Kia, Kia Jacks on Bond to the Max. When you worry about your children's safety, when you struggle to pay the bills, when you need a helping hand, there's only one news team you can count on. Hometown voices who invest time into important stories, committed to solving problems, getting results, making it worth your time to watch every day. When you want a news team who understands why local is what matters most, watch News 4 Jacks every night starting at 5, the local station. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. John Delaney is with us, the former president of the University of North Florida, also a former mayor in Jacksonville. I'd like to hear your thoughts on what recently happened on Election Day. Uh, voters overwhelmingly in Duval County said yes to a half-cent sales tax. It's designed to help rebuild uh, the crumbling schools. I'd amend it to say they passed it in a landslide, and I mean, that's incredible. And um, re really, you know, a lot of the questions are, how come the schools got in this bad of shape? Yep. Well, because all these other counties already had that half-cent sales tax, and most of them have an additional fee that goes in towards helping school remediation, school construction and repair. So it's a tremendous day. I mean, that's a huge margin. People want to invest in, in their kids. And really what a lot of people don't realize is that at any one point in time, 80% of the voters don't have a kid in public school. Um, you know, mine are grown, I think That's yours right, are grown. Sure. They're not in public school or they're private school, they're being homeschooled. So to have that margin of a victory, I think is uh, Jacksonville voting to invest in itself. I think that's a, it's a great thing. Some questions have come up about, hey, what do we do to make sure that these, these monies go to the right place? Uh, what about oversight? Do you, do you favor that there should be maybe a citizen oversight committee like there was with a better Jacksonville plan. Yeah, that's structured to do that, to have that. It was an immensely popular thing, uh, you know, back, back when it was always covered by the media, every one of those meetings and you had the updates going on. So I think that's a good thing. And I've already seen some of the names that are willing to serve on that committee. That provides a conscious, they have to air it every month or two or three, once a quarter maybe, explain how things are looking. And I think that's healthy too. Yeah, some of the, the criticism was, hey, if they haven't spent the money the right way in the past, how do we know they'll do it in the future? But this oversight committee is one way to, to make that happen. Yeah, and just to, to comfort the, the, the public a little bit, the money is only for construction. It can't go to bureaucracy and hiring people. It's only for construction. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I think the processes are in place to do those right. I think the superintendent is really, she's a pro at this stuff. I've kind of gotten to know her, and I like her immensely. And... Um, um, I think she's a winner. It's good to have her in town. Yeah, talked about Dr. Diana Green. Uh, so let's let's move on to another topic. That, so that when I tease this segment a moment ago, I say, hey, one problem we might have found a solution to. The mystery remains what to do in Jacksonville uh, about the violent crime. Uh, more than 500 people shot in the city during 2020. Just about as many killings through homicide or murder at this point as there were all of last year. What are your thoughts here? What is a mayor, what is a city council, what is the JSO to do about rising criminal activity like oh, that? Oh, it's disturbing. You know, I was the chief assistant state attorney prior to moving to City Hall, and that was the peak of the crack cocaine epidemic in the late 80s and early 90s, where I think we topped 200 murders on a much smaller city. And, um, you know, really often the sheriff gets blamed if, if crime goes up he or she comes in after the crime goes on. And so it really is gonna be prevention up front. Um, you know, you gotta work on poverty, we gotta keep people in school, we gotta try to get them the highest education that they're interested in and are capable of. You wanna have jobs. Um, I, I do think churches need to weigh in more. They're clustered in uh, city council districts seven, eight, nine, and 10 for the most part. There's drugs involved, there are gangs involved, and um, uh, you know, it's always guns. It's rarely anything other than a gun. And so it's a cultural thing we've got to work on as a community as a whole. Nobody's mastered it. You know, Philadelphia is a train wreck, Chicago, New York, um, Detroit. Um, and it's, it's just something I think needs to be on the top of our discussion and run down that list. Mayor Payton made a stab at it and he came, came up with a program to really spend a chunk of money. Kind of was the mother of all crime prevention programs and it did tamp it down for a while. Recession hits, it's hard to keep it going. 
uh, back in 08, 2008. And so um, it's going to take a lot of investment in prevention. And then once people are convicted, one of the things Nat Glover, former sheriff and yeah. President Edward Waters College was big on is once you're convicted, it's hard to get a job. And if you don't have a job, you're going to steal. That's just simply the way it's going to turn out. And for those who have been convicted, I've heard them tell me that when, when incarcerated, you're just thinking about the next crime you're gonna commit when you get out. So uh, back to maybe this point, and, and maybe you have these conversations with Mayor Curry, but if the mayor, or if the sheriff came to you today and said, hey, what do you think I should do? How would we tweak it? Because I know that the mayor's got a Kids Hope Alliance and we've got things to try and offer prevention. Right? Yeah, it's not going to be one program. It's probably going to be a series of 10, somewhere under that Kids Hope Alliance that you hope could have some more funding. You know, when you are in that office and, and when you're a sheriff, you feel every one of those murders. I mean, you see the pictures. Often you're at the funerals. I know uh, Mayor Payton, um, I can't remember the name of the, the young girl that I think was studying in her, in her house and a bullet went through and killed her. And uh, it deeply impacted him. And so I, I, I'm... Uh, Mayor Curry and I have not talked about it, but I know that he's concerned with it. And, but it's, it's not going to be one thing. I th it's going to be 10, 12, 15 different things to try to temper it. And I kind of hit some of those highlights. You want to keep people in school. Uh, you want to help them get an education. You want to help them get a higher education if they can. You want to remediate them if they have been caught in a crime. Uh, you want to educate them if they're sitting incarcerated. Uh, it's not one switch. Nobody's cured it, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah. So a final thing here in our final minute for the segment, uh, Mayor Curry told me last week, he said, hey, uh, it's not the wild, wild west in Jacksonville, but how do we make, how do we stop it really? Would you agree with that characterization? It, it is maybe to his point, the, the gang element and some of those things, it's not every corner where you're at risk of being shot. No, it's not. It's not every corner. There's no question of that. And, and, um, but that doesn't mean if you're one of those 180 or 190 people that, that your family is going to feel any better. And if it is just clustered in one area, that's bad enough. And, and um, if that almost makes it worse if it's that many murders that are in a fairly small geographic area. Uh, it's a shocker to me. There's gunshots in those, in those neighborhoods every single night going off. And that's just not right. Yeah. Well, I will tell you what is right. Getting to visit with you on a variety of topics. I appreciate your uh, expertise and insights and, and sharing some time. Well, thanks again. Today. I appreciate your professionalism. All right. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. So uh, you stick around, though. We're going to let John Delaney leave. We're going to ask you to stick around. We're going to talk some plus minus when we come back. The positives and negatives for Democrats in Florida. Daniel Henry is here next on This Week in Jacksonville. Toyotathon is on. Now's the time to get a great deal on Tacoma, RAV4, Camry, and more. I'll take it. I'll get this wrapped up for you. I wish I hadn't just unwrapped it. Ugh. Right now, during Toyotathon, lease a new 2021 Toyota Corolla LE for just $179 a month or 36 months plus $500 holiday bonus cash. Toyotathon is on. Come in today. Toyota, let's go places. How do I use better than bouillon? I just add a spoonful to my marinades. To stir fries? Sauces. Just whisk it in. Brush it on? Saute it. It adds a cooked all day taste. That doesn't take all day. Better than bouillon. Don't just make it, make it better. Do you have dry, cracked hands from constant washing, cold weather, and hard work? Try O'Keefe's Working Hands. It's America's number one selling hand cream for guaranteed relief for extremely dry, cracked hands. Also available in O'Keefe's Lip Repair. Guaranteed relief for extremely dry, cracked lips. Goodwill Industries is proud to have served North Florida for over 80 years. From scholarships to employment, your donations make a difference in our community for people like Kayla. Before Goodwill and A Step, I wanted more for me and my kids. I decided to go to school. They took care of daycare. It's so much more than just a financial support. If it were just me, it would have been so easy to give up. There are people out there that, that are rooting for you. We are Goodwill, removing barriers to employment. I'm John Ossoff, and I approve this message. Weeks before the stock market crashed, the Senate received a classified briefing on COVID-19. That same day, David Perdue bought medical equipment stock. Then he bought vaccine shares, dumped casino stock, millions in stock trades, while the rest of us were in the dark. At the same time, David Perdue told us the risk was low and would have little impact on our economy. David Perdue lied to us while he lined his own pockets.
don't need no saving Running on my own. I won't apologize It makes me Growing up in a community like Green Cove Springs shapes how you see the world. It makes you a better neighbor and a better listener. This town also gave me an appreciation for the people in our community, which is why Harold & Harold is focused on helping others in need. If you've been in an accident, you don't have to recover alone. We're with you. Harold & Harold, call us, 251-1111. Don't settle for less than you deserve. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. And in this segment, Daniel Henry is joining us, the chairman of the Duval County Democratic Party. Daniel, congratulations on something unusual happening in Jacksonville. Uh, for the first time in decades, Duval County turned blue in a presidential election. Why don't you tell us about the last time that happened and then tell us how it happened in 2020? Yeah, so thanks, Kent. So the first, the last time that Democrats won this county in a presidential election was the race between Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. So since 1976. So this is something that has stymied us for 44 years. And we are enthusiastic about the win that we were able to uh, to have here in Duval. Uh, it represents almost a five point shift from where we were in the 2016 election when Hillary Clinton lost this county by a little under 6000 votes. Uh, the volunteers, the activists, the the members, uh, all that have been working within the party and outside the party to be able to get us to this win are the main reasons why we were able to get this accomplishment. Uh, in 2018, when we went blue in the gubernatorial race was obviously our first indication that it was something that's possible. Well, uh, so maybe describe this 2020 so unusual and you had to change up things because of the pandemic. What kind of adjustments did you make that were successful this time around? Yeah, so Kent, we were canvassing up until March uh, before the outbreak of COVID-19 and it kind of had to uh, force a change in how we would traditionally talk to voters. Uh, one of the biggest advantages that the Democratic Party has is our love and our consistency in canvassing. Uh, but that tool was taken out of our toolbox. So we had to adapt. And finding ways to talk to voters via text, via phone calls, uh, via non-contactless uh, uh, canvases and door knocks, um, finding ways to have community type events where people would be able to socially distance uh, having drive-in rallies that became a lot more popular across the country and even here in Duval County were some of the ways that we used to continue to engage with our voters. Um, but in particular, getting voters the education that they needed to know when early voting started, know when election day started, but also signing up a lot of voters for vote by mail. That was that was key for us to be able to get this win. Well, yeah, so a, a key time and a key result, certainly for what you're doing with the uh, Duval County Democratic Party. Let me talk about what happened statewide, though, because not not so much of a celebration there. I'm going to show a graphic here. This was a, a headline uh, on Politico. Uh, I'm not a bleeping socialist. Florida Democrats are having a post-election meltdown. So the state party recording one of the worst election performances in the country is what it said. How were things on the statewide level beyond Duval County, and why did things not turn out as well for Democrats in this most recent election? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you're right, Duval was an outlier. Uh, we had some of the single greatest vote share improvements for a presidential candidate than any other county in the state. Uh, but that obviously did not translate to a lot of southern counties where we saw vote share loss in Palm Beach and in Miami-Dade and some other counties as well. Uh, I think a lot of candidates, particularly in South Florida, that lost close elections were very frustrated uh, by the messaging and branding that the Trump campaign and the state GOP used to try to brandish their campaigns. And I, I think that line in the political article, it shows the frustration in that. Uh, but uh, I think this creates opportunities for the state party to learn its lesson, to learn that we need to reach out to communities of color a lot sooner. Uh, than election times uh, to ensure that we are able to define ourselves before the opposition will be able to define us. Um, and to have that level of consistency of 
voter registration throughout an entire election cycle. Um, I know obviously COVID-19 kind of prevented us from being able to do a lot of the things that we traditionally do before um, elections, uh, but I think it's causing us to be able to reevaluate some of the decisions that the state party made um, across the board and adapt to some of the realities that we're now living in. Uh, and that's campaigning in a post-COVID-19 world. Right. Well, so how frustrating is that uh, to be characterized as if you're a Democrat, you're a socialist? And that certainly is part of the playbook from the other side uh, that we saw in the most recent election. It's frustrating, I would say, and I can't speak for those candidates, so I can just speak for myself. Self, but I would say it's frustrating because uh, when you're a candidate and you have to essentially respond to a lie and disprove a lie, you're already at the defensive mode. And I think a lot of candidates, particularly in South Florida, um, a good example would be outgoing Senator uh, Jose Rodriguez that lost his seat by 32 votes, um, is a prime example of that. Or Congressman Shalala or, Shalala or Congressman Debbie Waspin Powell. Um, those, uh, those three politicians lost their races and, and races that we never thought uh, they had the potential for them to lose, but they did. And uh, the messaging that was going on, particularly in the Hispanic community, um, from the Republican side was very persuasive in kind of turning voters uh, against those incumbents. And uh, I think it's now for us to be able to continue that outreach in communities of color well before election time so that it's not susceptible to those types of messages. Yeah. Hey, so just 30 seconds or so. How did you feel about the campaign locally for Congress by Donna Deegan? A lot of people said uh, she wasn't going to win because of the gerrymandering of the district. How did you feel about her campaign, though? I think she ran an amazing campaign. I don't think anyone um, probably took a race uh, in Congressional District 4 seriously for a Democrat. Uh, but she put everything out there on the line. She raised a massive amount of money, had a massive amount of a volunteer base that were enthusiastic about her campaign. And she performed a lot better than any other Democrat has ever performed in this district. But obviously the election results that we saw, despite her um, increases from the last two elections that Democrats have run in, in this race were positive. Uh, but the seat is gerrymandered. It's gerrymandered in a way that ensures a Republican wins. It, and, it, it is. Uh, Daniel, I'm, I'm running yeah. out of time here, but uh, we're talking about running races. I know we're going to talk more about the races in the, uh, in the months to come. Daniel Henry, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you so much for watching us here on uh, This Week in Jacksonville. We are every, more, every Sunday morning, that is, at 9 a.m. here on Channel 4 and at noon on the CW17. See why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida and South Georgia's number one source for local news.